stuff. Um, what else is there? I think that's uh, all we have uh, in terms of announcements. So, uh, oh yes, there's another thing. We will ask you, we, we are thinking of organizing a bus to go on Saturday back to Bologna. And for that, we need to know your departure points. So we'll set a Google Doc where you can enter your departure time if you want to go on a bus on Saturday, and we'll try to find a reasonable bus departure time. I believe this weekend trains were not fully functional, and this may happen next Saturday too. So, so yeah, be aware that trains are, I think, not reliable in these words they are. <laughs> On that note, um, yeah, great to see you all again this morning. What a great morning it is this morning. I uh, went out this morning and thought it was fantastic. I hope you're all feeling refreshed and ready to get stuck into a, another hour and a half of low and dirty um, VM implementation stuff. And rem remember, uh, please feel free to just interrupt and ask questions as I go along. Uh, before I start, I just want to do a little quick recap so you can remember where we've been, where we were yesterday with this talk. What I wanted to do, first of all, was to motivate for you the very idea that we probably need to think differently about VM implementation and that, uh, that we have a lot of problems with language design and, and a number of you pointed out that the language design issues are not limited to implementation related things. You can design a bad language no matter how good your implementation is. That, that's perfectly possible. In fact, it's very possible. But um, nonetheless, our hypothesis is that a lot of problems in language implementation uh, due to the difficulty of correctly implementing them. So what the mission here is to try and make it easier to, to correctly implement your language so that you might at least not have that hurdle facing you when you try to make a good language. So that's the context, just trying to refresh you. And what I did is I started uh, having motivated or attempting to motivate it, I, I sketched quickly current approaches. And you may remember I sketched two broad approaches that people currently take. One is to build a monolithic runtime. They build the whole thing from scratch themselves. And another is that they piggyback on a large infrastructure such as LLVM or the JVM or .NET or something like that. They're the two broad approaches. And you may recall what the approach that we're proposing is to build what we call a micro VM, which is a tiny thing by comparison to those other things. Just about 20,000 lines of code that just does three abstractions. Can you all remember what they were? Abstraction over memory for memory safety, that's a GC. Abstraction over the architecture, the platform, that's the JIT backend, and abstraction over concurrency, that's providing you with concurrency primitives and a safe world in which you can build up interesting concurrency models. Okay, there are the three abstractions we wanted to provide, and we wanted to do that very succinctly, and ideally, we want to do it correctly. And a side project, which I haven't talked about much, but I mentioned in passing, is an effort to do a formal verification of our implementation of this runtime. Okay? And um, the idea would be that you'd have, you'd push your, your, your um, verification efforts higher in the stack and you'd be able to build your um, language on top of a formally verified runtime, okay? The other thing I haven't spoken about, and I know I, I don't plan to speak, speak about today, but I'm very happy to talk to you about offline, is the actual runtime. And I mentioned in the past when I flashed up all those things about crashing language and so forth, how a lot of the problems with our current runtimes, like V8 and uh, uh, various languages like that, when you go and look at these security advisories, they very often trace back to the choice of implementation language. And very often it goes back to C++ code in the implementation of the runtime, or even assembly code in the implementation of the runtime. And so that itself is, is obviously a source of problems, and there are many different approaches to stepping away from that. And of course, one is to do something in a high-level language, like PyPy is a great example of that. Jixavim was a great example in the Java domain, where you build your runtime in a language, in a, in a language that you have, a high-level language that you've got a lot more trust, trust in. Um, what we've done with our runtime, and again, I'm not going to speak about it at any length today, is to build that little itty-bitty runtime in Rust. And that's been a very interesting exercise. All right, let me get on with the talk. 
I, I want to put this back up here again because I do want to stress that I'm just one part of a large group of people who've worked very hard on this. And in fact, I, I really want to call out a few names here. I'll just quickly go through these students and tell you roughly what they're doing. So Tim is at UMass and he's been working on the uh, JIT back end for PyPy. So that is taking PyPy taking its JIT and retargeting it from machine code from x86 to, um, to mu IR. Okay, so retargeting their JIT to mu, mu IR. That's one part of our PyPy port. Um, Javad, he's a new student, PhD student working with me. He's retargeting mu, um, our runtime to the cell 4 um, microkernel, and he's pretty much got that going. And his focus is on real time. Mu. So I have a real-time instance of Mu running on a real-time um, microkernel. Elin, Elin's a senior grad student in my group, and he has done almost all the implementation work on the Mu implementation itself. So building the GCs, building the JIT, building the um, uh, the scheduler, and he's the one who's done all that work in Rust. And he had a paper at ISMM two years ago that talked about the. It was a pretty interesting story about how we built. GC in Rust, because at that point people hadn't used Rust to do something quite like that, where they really cared about performance deeply and they needed the correctness. So, um, oh, and more, and more the point that one of the interesting twists there, of course, is we had to break Rust in certain, to, to a certain extent, break its safety to be able to implement a GC because you're doing something at a very low level. And the question was just how much did we need to break Rust? And the answer was a very satisfying, not much at all. So um, that was a very good story. Um, Adam is working at UMass. He's working on the formal verification work. He's a grad student at UMass. Kun Chan is, has now graduated. He's now at Huawei in Beijing. And he is the student who did the whole spec. He implemented the first reference implementation. A large part of what I've been talking about and what I will talk about today is done by uh, Kunshan and, and indeed many of the slides that you're going to see here are based on slides that Kunshan produced. So I really want to call out Kunshan. Hongbo is, a, is a, a student working with me. He's working on our RISC-V port and a lot of that's actually about porting Rust to RISC-V or getting the Rust port of RISC-V working. John Zhang uh, is a, a, a research assistant working with me. He, he did an undergraduate uh, thesis with me. His job was doing all of PyPy. So he did all of PyPy except the JIT. The JIT was done by Tim Allman. So John Zhang did this huge amount of work in getting PyPy running on Mu. And Pavel's an undergrad who's just started working with me on the Haskell port. All right. Uh, and these guys here, I'll call out these guys, undergrads. Uh, Isaac, he has just completed the ARM port, so uh, the, our ARM back end for Mu. Um, this guy, Andrew Hall, did the initial version of our um, Haskell um, implementation along with Nathan. All right. So now we're moving on. We're talking about how Mu works, and I'm going to talk about the instruction set. And if you may remember that one of the design principles, can anyone remember any of our design principles? We had some pretty firm design principles when we were building Mu. Anyone remember any of them? Minimality, I'm glad someone remembered that because that that's really the most important one of all, minimality. It's minimalist, right? And the other one is, one of the other ones we had was the idea that we should use LLVM as a frame of reference because it, LLVM more or less has got things right and uh, has got a huge community around it and it, this, it's just completely pointless to gratuitously invent our own version. So what we did is we took LLVM IR and we only deviated from it in places where there was a principled reason to do so. Okay, so when you look at this, some of it will look familiar to you if you were paying attention yesterday and the day before when you looked at LLVM. I'm throwing that web page up there just because I just want to highlight for you that all this stuff is pretty thoroughly documented on the web page. If you go to um, microvm.org, you'll find all this stuff. And so you'll find a, a lengthy description of the instruction set with uh, all of the instructions pretty well documented. Uh, so what have we got in there? We've got basic arithmetic and logic instructions. We've got control flow instructions. Concurrency and me memory access instructions. Remember, one of the things we do is we abstract over concurrency. So the instruction set has instructions that reflect that. Um, we've got stack binding and swap stack instructions. Swap stack's interesting. I'm going to talk about that a little later. Um, and we've got the unsafe native interface. The unsafe native interface is, of course, necessary for any runtime if you want to bind to libraries and whatnot which are written outside of your world, for example, written in C. Right? So you need to have a, some way of interfacing with the outside world in a clean way, and that's what the unsafe native interface is. All right, so we're going to dive into basic arithmetic and logic. And 
you'll see this is clearly inspired by LLVM. If you can't read that at the back, it doesn't matter terribly much. But the, the basic idea is you've got these LLVM instructions here, and you've got the mu equivalents here. And um, there's a small syntactic difference, but they're very similar. Um, and about the only thing that you get here is this refcast instruction, which allows you to um, cast a reference in um, mu that makes sense. In, in LLVM it does not because you have no concept of references. Remember, LLVM has pointers, but it does not have references. Mu has both pointers and references. Pointers are unsafe. That's like a void star. It's just some pointer into memory. A, a reference is a reference to an object, and it's opaque. We don't know. You, the user of mu, do not know if mu is implementing that via a handle or what. You have no idea. It's an opaque reference to an object. Well, it's it's type. It's it's strongly typed. So, um, well, it has a type system, and so you have a type for your reference. And if you want to, um, yeah. So the card allows you to, to cast one type of reference to another type of reference. It doesn't know about the concept of an ob object. It just sees structs and so forth. Big pardon? Um, oh, that's a good question. I'll have to take that offline. I, I, I don't recall the answer to that. Um, although there's a premise here um, that goes through all of the stuff, and that is that you, the client, know what you're doing. All right? So. Um, we allow you to do stupid things. You, we allow you to shoot yourself in the foot. So you could do a cast. Of, you know, it's possible to give to do a cast that made no sense. Okay, and and if we'll have to look at the ref cast instruction and see how it documents what happens when you do that. And I don't recall it off the top of my head. Okay, so one of the first things is that mu has much less undefined behavior than LLVM. Now, why would that be? Can anyone guess why that is? This is not a criticism of LLVM at all. It's just a statement of fact. Can anyone guess why that would be? Minimalism, Minimalism yeah, maybe. B the basic thing is LLVM is designed for C, and C has a lot of undefined behavior in the language itself, okay? So it needs that, and we're not, we're not reflecting the C standard. We're, we're trying to, and we're also aiming at uh, formal verification. So we really want to eradicate undefined behavior wherever we possibly can, and seeing as we're not bound to C, we can do that to, to some extent. So for example, signed NG overflow, so you see up over there, you, you do this. Now, in C and C++, that is actually formally undefined behavior. Okay, the behavior when you have signed NG overflow is, is, is not defined. Okay, under a bunch of other things, it is, including it with LLVM, um, there's defined behavior there. Okay, and what happens is that you have an overflow flag that gets set. So. For example, here we have an add instruction in mu, and that there is an optional flag to add that says set the overflow flag. And then um, the result, you get two results. You get the result of the addition and you get the overflow flag, and then you can do a branch uh, on the overflow flag as a result. Okay? Um, and for example, you could have the branch to an, to an exception handler. In this case, we're going to do a branch to the exception handler so you can implement a language. Like, yep, Jan. Does this imply overhead? It depends on, your, it depends on what you, you're targeting and how you can compile it, but it need not. For, for, for example, on a lot of architectures, you don't. It won't imply overhead. Um, oops, yeah, so it depends on how you'd implement it. On the MIPS, it's going to be different, but on most architectures, it's, it's straightforward. So it, it need not imply any overhead. Um, division by zero, same thing, similar, similar sort of thing, different behavior. So here you've got undefined behavior on C, C++, and uh, LLVM, undefined behavior for a division by zero. Um, on, these, oops, on these architectures here, you get a hardware trap. Um, in Java, you raise an exception. In Mu, what it does is it jumps to an exceptional destination. So you can do this. So you can say, on exception, you can have the normal de destination, and on exception, go to the divide by zero handler. So you can, de you can define the behavior on the exceptional case. Um, now, here's something interesting. Um, MuIR has less optimization hinting than LLVM. Right, this, is an, this, is, this is quite interesting. It's slightly counterintuitive, perhaps. Now, I've got a little example here, which I've, I just took. I was trying to get around to, to, for a good way to explain this, because I find it a little bit hard to explain. And as I was doing my little web search, I, I bumped into this paper here, which is a great paper. 
and so it's going to show up in PLDI 2017, so it's going to show up in June. It's from um, Utah. And is there anyone here who's an author on that paper? Maybe there is. Um, anyway, this is, this is from um, John Rigueur and co. At, at Utah, and it's called Taming Undefined Behavior in LLVM. But they give this example here, which is in Swift. And if you look at that, you can see in that case there, in this example in, in Swift, that that addition, can anyone see anything interesting, that, you know, straightforward, that you can analyze statically with respect to that addition? Well, you, you, know, you, know it's, you know it can't overflow, right? Whatever A and B are, it can't, this, this cannot overflow. So the way that gets compiled to LLVM is like this, okay? You have the and, the two ands, and then you have the addition. Now, what's interesting is these two flags here. Okay, those two flags there is no signed um, wrap and no unsigned wrap. Okay, and what they are is essentially hints from the compiler, essentially to itself, saying, "Look, I know I can I, I can ensure that this that this won't generate an overflow. So I'm happy to say that the behavior on overflow is undefined, and I'll still be correct." Okay, one of the interesting points in this paper, they say you, you should not be afraid of undefined behavior. That's perfectly fine. Uh, undefined behavior is not an incorrect behavior. And in fact, what you want is you want to identify where that is, is allowable. Because in this case here, you know it cannot actually arise. So it's perfectly fine to say, I can do one of these additions, which does have this undefined behavior. Okay, because I know this addition won't trigger it. I can prove it statically. Okay, now in this case here, it makes no difference at all in this little tiny example. Right? It makes no difference at all because there's no optimization to be done in this tiny little example. But they point out that when you compile the Swift benchmark, some huge fraction of the additions have these flags put in there because there's so many cases where this is true. And why do they do that if, it doesn't, if it's useless in this case here? Can anyone guess why you bother doing this? Why would LLVM bother doing, putting the, those hints there? These are hints, optimization hints. And I just told you that it's useless in this setting here because you've got a little function um, and it's never going to arise, so there's, there's not much to be gained from this. Why would you bother doing it? And the, my, I'm making the assertion they do do this, and it's done extensively. Why would you do it if it doesn't if it doesn't help you in this case? Well, the answer is you do inlining. You do a lot of inlining, and so you know right now, right here, in this context, that this is true. You can assert this is true, and then later on, this gets inlined and put into a much broader context, and there may be opportunities to optimize then, and that's why they do it, and it's done very, very extensively. Anyway, the point of all this is that, that we don't have such flags. This is a long-winded way of me telling you that we don't have such flags, and the reason why we don't have such flags in MUIR is because all that sort of optimization is done at a level above us. Okay? That is done inside of the client. Because remember, we're minimalists, as someone said before, that that would be the answer. Yes, we are minimalists, so we don't do any of these optimizations. So we expect that the client will do any such optimization. All right. So that's roughly what we're seeing here. If LLVM client is going to be thinner than um, a MU client, and that a MU client needs to do, it or do, do its own optimizations. Yep. Oh, only low level ones, right? We do register allocation in inlining. They're pretty important optimizations. They're extremely important optimizations, but they're very low level ones. Okay? So we don't do very many optimizations. All right? Do we can do inlining, yeah. Do you, you the, the level above may do that as well, but we can do inlining, right? And, and, and a whole bunch of things in terms of instruction selection, instruction reordering, and so forth. There's a whole bunch of optimizations you do at that, at that level. But we don't do any high-level optimizations at all. All right, so now onto control flow. Again, you'll find that this is documented in the, on, the, on the web pages. Now, here's something interesting, is that we use what we call a go-to with values form of SSA. And this, uh, the, the, that phrase is coined by Elliot Moss. Go-to with values. So, what does that mean? It means that labels declare the incoming variable. So when you've got a label on a basic block, okay, and you remember this from your, the, the, the lecture yesterday and the day before, you've got a basic block and you've got a label on it, and you're going to branch to that basic block, right? Well, with our IR, that basic block declares any incoming values. SSA variables are declared at the entry into the block, right? Um, and when you branch somewhere, you pass the variables to the block you're branching to. 
And so this is a, the equivalent of a phi, a phi function. Why would we do this? Can anyone guess why we'd do this? Yep. Um, this is for basic blocks, OK? Not for functions. This is for basic blocks. This is intra-function. Inside of a function, you've got a, a big pile of basic blocks. Now, with regular SSA, you don't say which, you don't declare which variables are, are, are live across basic block boundaries. You, it's just implicit. OK? It's implicit. In our IR, it's explicit. It's, right? It's explicit. Can anyone see a negative? There's a clear negative to our approach. Can anyone see what that is? All right, you've got a the coffee, coffee hasn't kicked in yet. What? What's a negative? More exactly. Right? It's more verbose. That's the obvious negative. So when you declare the branch, you've now, instead of saying, you know, foo branch and a bunch of instructions, you say foo and then a bunch of I, uh, I, uh, SSA variables. Right? So it's more verbose. And when you do a branch, you've not just got to say to that label, but with these SSA variables. It's verbose. Right? Okay. Does that matter? Well, it's an IR, um, and having the IR verbose, verbose arguably is not really a big deal. It doesn't actually get materialized anywhere. So it doesn't actually take up space or anything. But, but that's absolutely true, and it's, it's a clear negative. In fact, you'll see in a minute, I'll, I'll list that as a negative, right? So it's more verbose, but what are the advantages? It, yeah, it means that we know the live ranges. Um, well, at least <laughs> we know. Mu knows the live ranges because why? Why does Mu know the live ranges? Because it's, it's explicit here, but how did that happen? Who did that? Where did it come from? The client. The client had to figure this out and say, look, here's the variable. The client had to do the work. We're pushing the work up to the client. So you tell us what's live here, and, and we'll take this. So we're pushing work up to the client. Okay? So let's look at an example here. So here's an example. Um, and here, we've explicitly declared that there'll be an incoming, incoming SSA variable here, which is called n. And then here we do a branch. Um, we've got a zero and an, we've got is zero and not zero. So here's our two basic blocks. That's the is zero. This is a, um, what is this? This is factorial. Okay, so this is an implementation, a very simple implementation of factorial in our, our, our IR. And you'll see here you've got the entry and you've got two cases here. You've got the is zero case, which just returns, returns the value one, right? It's a constant one. So it just returns one. And then you've got this not zero. Now what not zero has done is it's explicitly declared it's going to take an SSA variable n. Right? And then what you'll see, if you go and carefully examine here, this, there are no SSA variables in here that aren't declared there or declared there. Right? So you can look at this basic block and optimize it on its own. Right? It's, it's, it's complete in some sense. And you don't have to do any live analysis. Right? So SSA variables are strictly block local. You can't just refer to an SSA variable up here. You can't do that. Um, and it appears verbose. But it means there's no live variable analysis within mu, which saves us a bunch of work, which as I forget who it was, I think it might have been Jan. Someone was saying yesterday that often when you, uh, someone was saying often when you do these analyses, static analyses, um, you, can do t you can piggyback one analysis on another. Okay, you can do two things together. So doing this is something that's probably being done, done anyway by the client. Okay, so we're just we're going to piggyback off of that. The live ranges are broken up, which should help a coalescing register allocator. So this should make it easier for us to have a high performance register allocator that gives you a good result without much effort. And we don't want, want to do much effort. Why don't we want to do much effort? Well, we're minimal. We're lazy. No, it's not that because we're lazy. It's because this is often invoked at runtime. We're going to be like a JIT backend. So we do not want expensive. Th we, we always want to avoid doing things that are expensive if we possibly can. So if we can do good quality register allocation cheaply, that's a good thing. And finally, and this goes to the minimalism thing, this simplicity, this is actually a much simpler form, if you like, it aids formal verification. Okay, it's much clearer what's going on here. Things are explicit rather than implicit. Okay? So this is the go-to with values form of SSA that we use. And um, it's a little bit unusual, but it's, it's, we've found it to be extremely good. It, and it was motivated by necessity. We found we, we had a lot of problems with regular SSA, given what we're trying to achieve. And eventually, this emerged as, a, as our solution. All right, back to control flow. What have we got here? Very similar to um, what you see with um, LLVM. 
you've got a what's called branch, and branch is actually a jump. That's an unconditional branch. There's only one place you branch to. Branch two is a conditional branch. It's got two targets. We've got switch. So we had a switch statement just like you find in our OVM. That's a multi-target um, switch statement. This is interesting. This is a watch point branch. Now, what a watch point is, is a little widget that we provide the client with that allows you to do predicated branching on a global predicate. Okay? So what that means is if there's some flag there, and if this, the minute this flag becomes true or false, whichever way, then instead of doing the, the fall through, it'll go into some exceptional code. Okay? Can anyone guess why we introduced this and why it's not an LLVM? Well, you don't just tell me why it's not an LLVM, but why did we want this? Well, I'll give you a big hint. It's to do with the way you implement um, managed languages. Yes, it could be a GC point. You could use it as a G point. You could definitely use it as a GC point. So you could set the flag and say, look, we're about to do GC, so take the exceptional path which suspends um, execution while we do the GC. Yes, that's, that's a great example. Speculation? speculation? Yeah, you can, you can do speculative uh, specialization or specu speculation, so you can have predicated code. So you can write some code and have a predicate and say, this code is always correct on the, as long as this predicate holds. And if it's very efficient to do the fall through, and we engineer this so that that's true, then there's very little cost. Right? And then when that global predicate fails, then you just flip this flag and you take the exceptional path. And the exceptional path might then go and re-implement that code. Okay? And it will generate two versions of it or generalize it or whatever. Or de-optimize it. Right. The, the WP branch does. Yeah. Yeah. It's a special exceptional branch, exceptional, um, branch in a control flow graph. So can anyone, th uh, I was going to ask you a question about that. Um, Right, so this, this, this predicated execution, can anyone see where, where you do this? This is an absolutely standard thing you do in most dynamic languages because you need to specialize. And you say, look, this code here has some, something which, um, something polymorphic, I'm gonna make the assumption that it's always X, it's always an int or whatever, and I'll write the code on that assumption. If, that, if my assumption breaks, then I'll regenerate the code, okay? So that's, a special widget that we provide, which is directly for um, managed languages and particularly for dynamic languages, okay? And we can build that very, very efficiently. And we have something about that in our um, ISMM paper, and we use it for, the, for uh, yield points in GC. Uh, we have call, which is, as you'd expect, is for calling a function. What do you think that is? That's for calling C. That's, that's C, and you can speci specify in the C call what your calling convention is, right? So you can specify the calling convention on the call. So you can call into a different piece of code which follows different calling convention and it'll generate the code appropriately for that. Uh, we have tail calls, okay? So we, we have a tail call instruction, and we have a ret, of course, a trap and a watch point. A watch point is um, related to the watch point branch, and we have throws, so you can throw an exception. All right, um, memory ops and concurrency. Remember, we abstract over concurrency. We provide fairly strong abstractions over concurrency. So again, you can have a look at the web page here. It tells you about our memory model and so forth. And basically, we use something like the C11 memory model, but we have some not notable differences. All right, so the assumption is, the underlying assumption in all this is that we have shared memory. So you have multiple threads and we have shared memory. And I didn't actually talk very much about threads before, and I, I think I may have glossed over this, and I remember now as I hit this slide here, someone asked me last night or yesterday afternoon about, about threads. Now, all that Muse says is that we will give you threads. In a minute, I'm gonna say more about threads and stacks. But we offer to give you threads. We will give you threads if you can, you can create a thread. So give me a thread, and I'll, we'll create you a thread. And we don't tell you how that thread's implemented, but you can think of it as being like a native thread, an OS-level thread. Okay, uh, so it's uh, so it's truly concurrent. You can assume that it's actually um, not just a green thread that's um, uh, um, not not actually concurrent. You can assume there's real concurrency going on here. Okay, so what do we have here to make the C11 like memory model work? Well, we have a bunch of memory operations here 
We have loads and stores, and these, these uh, you can have atomic memory operations for loads and stores, compare and exchange, and this, uh, there's a whole family of atomic read, modify, write instructions, including add, subtract, and, and so forth, which allow you to do a read, modify, write atomically. Okay, and then we have a fence instruction, okay, which forces an order. Um, then we have a whole lot of different memory orders. Okay, we have uh, non-atomic, which is, gives you no guarantees. Uh, we have relaxed, consume, acquire, we, uh, acquire and release. We have a acquire and release, we have um, acquire plus release, and we have sequentially consistent. So let me give you an example here. That just animated itself. All right, so that's your initial state, and you've got one thread running here, and another thread running here. And we initialize x to be one in this, this uh, instruction here in thread one. And thread two is going to do a load of y, y um, with acquire. It's going to do an acquire on y. And what's uh, thread one going to do? It's going to do a, y, um, a store to y with release. Okay? And it's storing the value two. Okay? And what this means is that there's this, this synchronization between this store and this load. And so we, you end up with a happens before relationship, which means that, what does that mean? It means that if this thread sees two in Y, it must see the one in X. Okay? It's, got, it's guaranteed that order, that our ordering is guaranteed. Okay? Because there's a synchronization between this Y, um, this store to Y here and this load to Y there. That synchronization is guaranteed, which means that you are guaranteed um, because you have program order in this thread, within the thread, um, and therefore you're guaranteed, if you, if you do see that, um, that two there, you must see the one there in this thread. Okay. Um, we provide Futex, if you, yeah, Suresh. So, so does the memory model provide the DRF guarantee? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Do you have a DRF guarantee in the memory model? So if your programs are DRF then you have a six, or do you, so I'm just curious how Oh, I don't know, sorry. I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to take that offline. I'm not sure. I can't answer that off the top of my head. Um, although it's well, it is well documented, so I can easily find the answer. Um, so we have Futex. And Futex is a very basic primitive for um, synchronization. And we provide that to the client. And then we let the client build up its own synchronization primitives on top of that. Okay? So it's really up to you as the client. There's all different kinds of synchronization primitives that you could build. And we saw this as a pretty good universal bedrock implementation. So it's like this. So we have here, we've got a memory model, we've got Futex. That's what we're providing you with. And then you go build yourselves locks and message queues and so forth and fork join and whatever on top of those primitives. So we provide you with primitives with very well-defined behaviors and it's, they're rich enough, we believe, to implement all manner of things at this level. And um, you, but it's up to you as a client to go and implement whatever it is that you want. Richard. Yep. Compared to what? I, I think, I, I look, we, I, I, we did have, we spent a lot of time discussing that. I mean, as, as background, I should tell you, this, the design of Mu, we had um, weekly meetings of about two hours for about two years. And it's all documented on this, this amazing blog there. So we can dig up that discussion at some point and I can go through it. And we would have, spread, we would have spent a lot of time going, um, thinking this through. I'm just trying to rec recall what the, uh, what the rational, rationale was. But essentially, th you can build that out of this. Right? And I think that's the bottom line. If you can build that out of this, then, then we're, we're, unless there's a really compelling reason for having that, then we're going to give you the more, more primitive operation. And that's what we've done. So I, th I think you could build it, well, yeah, anyway, we can, we can talk more about exactly how, how you'd build it, but I think every, every primitive, I think you can build, I think this is complete, uh, is I guess a, a strong statement, which I think is true. So you can build whatever it is you want using these primitives. Whether or not, I guess the, the, the question might be how well we can exploit whatever primitive the underlying architecture exposes, um, and I'm not sure, I have to think that through, I'm not sure. All right, this is interesting. This is SwapStack. Has anyone heard of SwapStack before? 
Okay, so there's a really cool paper, and I'm not even sure if I've got the reference to it here, um, from Trinity College Dublin from about three years ago, presenting this idea of swap stack. Um, and the basic idea is one of really strongly separating the idea of a thread from a stack. Okay, very strong separation of the idea of a thread and a stack and the ability to swap stacks around with respect to threads. Okay, let's, let's have a look at it. And we, we read through this and we realized this prim primitive was gonna be very powerful for us for a bunch of things. Can anyone guess, before I go through and tell you what it, it's useful for, can anyone guess how we end up using this primitive or why we like this primitive given what the goals of this project are? What was that? Coroutines, perfect. Yep. We can do coroutines. Yes, exactly. Anything else? What was that? Sure. Yep. Um, yep. Yes, you can do all sorts of strange things to the stack. Which I'll show you some weird things soon. Um, the other thing we, that's, that, that's uh, essential is OSR, on stack replacement. Okay, on stack replacement is notoriously difficult to implement correctly. But with swap stack, swap stack really uh, gives us a very powerful lever with which we can do a very clean implementation of OSR. And OSR has bedeviled very many um, VM implementers, implementers over the years because it's notoriously difficult. What it, you know what OSR is? On stack replacement says, here I'm running on top of my stack and you know what, I'm really inefficient. I'm gonna compile up a new version and I'm gonna replace myself with a new version of myself on the stack while the program's running. Okay, what does that imply? What do you need to do in order to dynamically replace the thing on top of the stack? Anyone? Well, you need to be able to generate the new code. That's obvious enough. Well, what else do you need to be able to do? Think about it. I'm going to take a rip a frame off the top of the stack. I'm in the middle of executing some function. Okay? And for whatever reason, I decide I can do better. I can implement this better. So I go and recompile that function. And now I want to switch from implementing that old version of this function to this new version of this function while I'm in the middle of executing it. So I'm in a loop and I'm, in, I'm, I'm at the 50th iteration of the loop and I'm like, you know what, I can do better than this. And I go and replace my implementation right in the middle of the 50th iteration of this loop with this much better optimized one. Maybe it's got loop unrolling and all sorts of fancy stuff in it. How are you gonna do that? What are the challenges, anyone? What's, or is there anything hard about this? Maybe this is straightforward. Pardon? Yeah, you've got to be able to match, you've got to be able to, the, the thing below you, you, your caller has to not notice that you've just changed. That's one thing you have to be able to do. What else do you have to do? Right, yep. But imagine that's already done for you and Atom well, no, no, I mean, that's a good point. But just imagine, just put, even putting that aside, now you've suddenly got your code, here's your highly optimized code, and you've got your slow version, and your slow version's still on top of the stack, right? And you want to switch them around. What do you need to do? Well, one thing is you've got to make sure that the caller doesn't notice, so it's got to obey that, it's got to, it's got to seamlessly plug in there. What else do you need to do? Yeah, and that's not at all trivial. You've got to, you've got to somehow or other recover exactly the state that that frame was at, all of the variables, all the live variables, you've got to recover all of that and inject it into this new fancy optimized version. Make that fancy optimized, optimized version move to exactly the same state. So it's got to be the 59th iteration of the loop and these variables all have these values. And then continue execution. Okay? This is not at all easy. Right? And that's what on stack replacement is. And um, what, one of the things we've done here is we've provided strong primitives for you, the client implementer, to do on stack replacement gracefully and without too much pain. Okay? And it's normally extremely difficult. And one of the keys to that is swap stack. Someone else had another question? Yep. All right. So, Muse view of threads and stacks. And this is partly motivated. So, if you're interested in this at all, I, I highly encourage you to go and look up that swap stack paper. The, one of the authors is David Gregg from Trinity, so use that as a, key, as a keyword if you want to do a web search. And swap stack is the, is, the, is the term they use, they coined that term. Okay, I'm going to use this rabbit guy here to represent a thread. He looks busy. Um, and the point is a thread is a unit of CPU scheduling and it's an actor. Okay, it's not state. Okay, it's an actor. Okay, whereas uh, a stack is a list of function activations and that's data. Okay, hopefully these ideas 
are fairly intuitive to you, but I think very often most people conflate the two. They think of threads and stacks very much intimately together. And what we're doing is very deliberately cleaving them apart and wanting you to think about them quite distinctly. And so you can switch what stack is associated with what thread. OK. So what is a thread? Well, a thread is a thread of control running through some code. OK, so that little rabbit guy runs through here, calls bar, bar, calls baz, returns, and comes in here. OK, it's a thread of control. OK, and what's a stack? Well, this is a stack representation of the same execution, but it's data. OK, so a stack, the stack's there on the right there. So we call foo. We've got some local variables, a and b. The program counter's pointing to something or other. And we go there, we, we call bar, and then we, now we push the state onto the stack there, which reflects our state of execution in bar. X has some value, and E has some value, and the program kind of points to something or other. OK, and then we go to there, and we call baz, and we have some state there, which reflects our state with respect to baz. And Y and G have certain values, and the program counter there points to, to a particular value. Right? So, this is, so what the stack is doing is reflecting a snapshot of execution. Okay, but the stack is data. The stack is data. The thread is the execution through some things which leads to a particular stack state. Yep. How come PC is the stack? Why is the PC important in the stack? Can anyone guess? Pardon? Yeah, you need to know where to return to. So there's different ways this gets encoded. It doesn't literally necessarily get encoded as PC equals, but you need to know where to return to. Okay, so when Baz returns, where does it go to? It needs to know where the PC was in bar. It needs to return to this point here. When it returns, it goes and calls Baz, and when it, this happens, it needs to come back to here, which means it needs to record that information. It needs to record that execution state, which is held in the PC. Right. Well, the, well, it's only that so you, you have the thread of control, and then you can that control the right. Right. Well, the, the, what you're doing here is essentially snapshotting the PC and saying, right now the PC is pointing there, and then you snapshot that, and then you move on. Okay. And when you come back here, oh, that's where this PC was, and you can resume. All right. So it's giving you a pointer in terms of where your state of execution was. All right. So maybe this is a bit mind-bendy for you, but maybe for some of you this is straightforward. But this is, a, I want to really strongly cleave apart the idea of the thread and the stack. Um, and then you can return, you blow away that stack frame, and then you return here and you blow away that stack frame, and then we're done. All right, and there's some point over here, coroutines are cool too. So st last in, first out is great for function calls, but if you have coroutines like this, uh, you don't really want um, a simple stack structure. You want to be able to do this kind of execution here. Um, which is a coroutine. Okay, so we can do that with um, with Muse stacks by having two stacks and one thread. Okay, so you have a stack on the left, and a stack on the right, and you've got one thread, the rabbit. All right, so he the thread moves from one stack to the other, blows away that frame, returns to this stack, and so forth. Okay, so we can implement coroutines using swap stack. So what you're doing is you're swapping the stack that's associated with this thread at this instant in time. Okay, so you've got a pool of stacks and you've got a number of threads and you disassociate stacks and threads as you need to. Okay, so what is swap stack useful for? Swap stack, as I say, is not something we've invented. That was uh, the, the folks at Trinity that did that. But it's very useful for implementing symmetric coroutines, lightweight threads. And um, it supports the micro VM mechanisms, both trap handling and on stack replacement. I already explained to you why it might be useful for on stack re replacement. What about trap handling? Can anyone guess what's going on there? And first of all, let me explain what a trap is in our sense. A trap is when, for some reason, we get to a point in execution and we go, ha, you know what? We needed to ask the client what to do next. Okay, so now we're going to hand over to the client explicitly. The control is going to go back directly to the client. Can anyone guess why you might want to do that? Lazy code loading, right? So you say you might you might say this is going to call function foo, but function foo hasn't actually been defined yet, right? So what you can do is you can have a trap and say if someone calls foo, well just trap and then ask the client say hey you better give me foo we're ready for it now. Then you get foo you compile it and then you continue your execution. Okay, so 
can you see now that a swap stack is extremely useful there because at one moment you've got you're executing on a live stack frame for the program then you hit a trap and then you step over to the client and say hey it's time to generate some code so we can call foo and then the client goes and runs its compiler and generates the frame um, generates the code and then when you're ready you say okay we can continue now and then it pushes it calls foo and then pushes the frame of the stack and you can continue where you left off okay so now the next part I'm going to talk about is the unsafe native interface. Oh, before we go on, any questions about swap stack? All right, someone asked about the unsafe native interface yesterday. Let's have a quick talk about that. So um, who here is familiar with JNI? Everyone know? No? JNI? Yeah. And, and, and anyone here know about .NET's unsafe? These are sort of similar ideas. They're, 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 they're quite different, but they're, um, they try to achieve similar things. So, um, and essentially, one of the purposes of these things is so you can interface with the other. Because you've got a safe, positive world here that you want to operate with um, uh, C sharp, say. But you want to be able to interface, you need to be able to interface sometimes with um, the wild native world. Can anyone give an example of where that might happen? Why would you want to interface with the outside world? Libraries. Not enough coffee yet. <laughs> really simple. You need to do it all the time. Every time you want to do, every, every time you want to interface with the operating system, for example, right? Basic I/O, right? You need to interface with the operating system, standard I/O libraries, and so forth. Every time you want to do I/O, there's a, just a, a ton of reasons why you need to be able to interface your lovely high-level language with the grotty outside world that's written in C. It's, it's unavoidable, okay? So you have to be able to do this, and the question is how can you do it efficiently and safely? Okay, because you don't want that dirtiness out there, the great unwashed C code stuff, to infect your beautiful, pristine world that you've created in your favorite lab. Okay, so the question is how can you interface those things in a reasonable way, and that's what this is about. Okay, and the way it works here is you've got a JVM here which has no pointers, right? You know in Java there are no pointers, you only have references in, in, in Java, right? No pointers. Just references, um, and then you have this, this essentially this glue code, which is very unsafe. That interfaces with the native libraries, and you have to craft this glue code extremely carefully. Okay, and what sort of hazards? Can anyone imagine what sort of hazards you might have here with this code? What sort of things do you have to be careful of? What what what, what are the sort of issues that might happen here? What, what, where are you vulnerable? Say say you're the implementer of this the language. You're the implementer of Java. Where could this really create problems for you? Yeah, why though? Oh, okay. So there's one class of problems, and that, that is this code could just explicitly do something stupid, right, that you wouldn't normally do, right? We could, you know, seg fault, right? But is there a way that it could do something unpleasant to you and make you behave badly? Yeah, it could mess up the garbage collector. How could it do that? Right, so it could grab a pointer into your beautiful, pristine, managed heap and then just start trashing your heap, right? So there are things like this which are, you know, there are huge problems here, and this is why this is, can be very, very dangerous, where this can reach into here and do nasty things. Or if you wanted to hand off a reference to something up here, and why would you ever want to do that anyway? Like which crazy person would ever want to do that? I'll give, to allow them to write into your heap. I'll give you a clue. If you, I've, I've spent a lot of time debugging the insides of Java VMs, and it's one of the most common things that happens is uh, it, it, what, there's a particular part of piece of code inside of VM implementations, actually in, in the Java standard libraries, that is frequently a cause of pain for me. And it's really, really frequently executed. Can anyone guess what that might be in relation to this here? Now, I ask the question, when would you ever, as a Java library implementer, want the C world to start writing into your heap? Yeah, exactly. Whenever you load data, right? And there's two, two, exam there's two cases that, that I just seem to, that, that I have nightmares about. They're just recurrent, right? One is the um, standard I.O. libraries. Because you say, hey, I want to read this in uh, from, you know, from the keyboard or from disk or from file or whatever. And what do you, how do you do that? You essentially say, here's a big buffer. Please put your stuff in this buffer. 
you want to hope that they, that they don't mess you up, right? Because they're just going to, you're just giving them a handle to your pristine heap and they're going to write stuff into it. And how do you, you know, and that's something you can't really avoid because as long as you want to be able to read stuff from disk or whatever it is into your heap, at some point you're going to have to trust someone to do it correctly. Okay, the other related one that, that for whatever reason in Java was constantly a source of bugs was um, zip, right? Zip and unzip, the compress and uncompress, and that, that code there is in the C world. And what, why would that constantly be an issue in Java? Anyone know? Jar files, right? The jar files are compressed zip files, and there's a bit of code there in the Java standard libraries that seems to be frequently a source of problems, and that is the code that takes a zip file and then decompresses it into the Java heap. All right, so we've got a need for this, and uh, hopefully I've made the point clear to you this is a dangerous thing, but it's necessary. Somehow you've got to try and manage this as gracefully as you possibly can. Um, they do it differently in .NET. What they do is they have the ability to write um, unsafe C sharp code inside of .NET um, rather than just handing everything off into the C world. But it's, 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 it's a similar, it's a different approach to solving a similar problem. All right, so, um, so how does our unsafe native interface work? Well, the first thing is we have these things called pointers, right? And that's just like an LLVM pointer as opposed to a mu reference. A reference is opaque, a reference is safe. And the GC knows about references. The, the GC explicitly does not know about pointers. Um, and then we have, uh, then we have um, a native function call, so we can do a C call, which calls, allows mu to call out to C, following the C calling convention. And we also allow the outside world to call into mu. Okay, why would you ever want to do that? or bootstrap time maybe, get your thing off the ground. So you, you, you've got an ELF library with your mu code there, you want to be able to execute it. So you need to call into it. Well, we have memory operations on pointers, so you can load and store from pointers. So if we have an object and the outside world is allowed to look at it, then we're going to have to interact nicely with a garbage collector, otherwise bad things might happen. Okay? And one, thing, one mechanism we have uh, for that is what we call object pinning. So say we have this object here, this object here, we're going to make this visible to the outside world. We need to make it visible to the outside world for some reason. So maybe we're going to read some data from a file or something like that. So the way we, what we have to do is we have to pin it, okay? And now what that's done is it's exposed an address. We've materialized an address. address. Before that, we just had an opaque reference. Now, bang, we've got a, a, an exposed address, a concrete address for this object. Okay, and then we have some native function which do, does stuff reading and writing to this, this uh, piece of memory. And then imagine we have a garbage collector operator. Imagine we've got a very efficient copying garbage collector and does some compaction or some, some stuff like that. And it moves the objects around. But because this object here has been pinned, that sends a message to the garbage collector that the garbage collector must not move this object so long as it's pinned. Okay, and then at some point we unpin. Now all this, these things here, the behavior here is undefined. Okay, so you cannot, the reference is no longer um, valid. Any, re, any dereference of that is undefined behavior. Okay, so you don't want to do that. Sure. That, 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 that's an unavoidable consequence of any pinning. So as, and this is true with Java or any other language. If, if you pin lots of things down, then you fragment. So obviously you want to do this judiciously. Yeah, or you can use a GC algorithm which copes gracefully with pinning. And there are, there are ones that, that handle that better or worse. For example, any, any, any non-moving collector will kind of naturally handle it, but it will have its own fragmentation issues. And there are other ones which have, have mixtures of moving and non-moving, which can handle it well enough too. All right. Um, oh, any... I was going to ask you all a question. I had a question lined up for this here. Oh, pinning. Can anyone see any, any interesting questions of how you do pinning in terms of a, in a multi-threaded context. Can anyone see any possible problems there? There's a really interesting problem here, or maybe it's not that interesting, but there, there's a, there's a, there is a problem here. So if your GC is in another thread, do you have to wait until the GC is sort of acknowledged that it's seen in this happening? Yeah, more or less. I mean, we don't expose that to the client, but that's an important, you're, you're right, that has to happen. Somehow or other, you have to make sure that if I call pin on the object, then the minute that instruction completes, 
the, if the, the GC respects it instantaneously, whatever that means. So there is a synchronization issue there, yes. The implementation, how that's implemented is a new implementation issue, but the semantics have to be clear. That is, the moment that pin has been done, the GC behaves correctly, which is interesting and not trivial. Yep. That would be sufficient, but it could be very expensive. Okay. What about it? Ah, right. Well, okay, so I was a little bit confused because we don't necessarily have object headers in Mu. We have some metadata for the object, but that may not be in the header of the object. It could be on the side, okay? But nonetheless, the, I, I get your point. So there is some metadata for this object, and there's going to be, a, ultimately, there's going to be a bit that says this is pinned or it's not pinned, right? Right, for this object. So, can you see the potential for a race around that pin? Exactly, exactly. That's exactly right. So we have to take very careful care of that. And the way we do it is we have thro thread local pin counts and your, the pin ultimately it bottoms out to being a single bit for the object, but that bit never gets flipped as long as anyone has any, any, um, count, any pin count. So how you do that efficiently is a really interesting problem. And, um, but, but yes, you have to think that through very, very carefully. All right, the client interface. So this is how the client talks to Mu. And this is very much like what you did in the LLVM lecture. Um, so do you remember in the LLVM lecture you wrote, what did you write? You wrote C++ code, right? And what was the C++ code? Sent from, from our, in our terminology, what you, you were the client. And you were talking to LLVM. And the way you talked to LLVM was by calling these functions that were on the screen there that you, 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 were, you were doing in your assignment and so forth. They were through the LLVM API, you were building um, basic blocks, you were building instructions. That was the API, okay? Julia, or whatever it is, you mean this language, you need to be able to say, okay, I need to construct a basic block. So please make me a basic block, please put this instruction in it, I need a branch here, and I want a label there, and so forth and so on. That's the API, and that's the way the client talks to Mu. Okay, and then ultimately it says, okay, I've made all this lovely code, please go, go and dispatch it into Mu. Okay, the code's ready, so here it is, and hand it off to Mu, and, and then you can, in principle, then, then create a thread and say, go execute this code. Okay, and that's how the world runs. Again, it's all documented here, you can read, read all about that there. So what is it, some people might get confused between the client API and the native interface, they're actually completely different things. The native interface is for accessing native code. This is, like I said before, so you can talk to the operating system or some other grungy piece of C code that is there by necessity. And um, whereas the Mu API is very much like what you do with LLVM code earlier, and that's how the client interfaces to this runtime says, creates some code, creates some UIR, and then and controls execution. Okay, and it can be quite loosely coupled with the Mu VM itself. It could be in the same process, it could be on the same machine, it could in principle be on a different machine. So we have what we call a bundle building API. A bundle is like uh, vaguely analogous to a Java class file. Okay, it's a, it's a coherent bunch of code and you can, you can create a bundle of code. Um, and so the client calls through to the Mu, a through the Mu API to the Mu VM and it builds up a, um, a Mu IR bundle. And it creates a bundle, and once it's ready, it can, um, once the bundle is ready, it can say, go execute this, uh, go, go and install this bundle, and then you can branch your execution to code that's in there. Okay, um, one thing we have here is the ability to call traps, and traps are traps out from executed code, so your code is executing inside Mu, and it can trap back out to you. As I said before, there are multiple reasons why, why you might want to do this, and it allows you to grab the control of the executing thread back to you, the client. And you can use this, for example, to, to stub out um, methods that aren't implemented. So you can say you, know, you have a stub for a method, uh, or a stub for a function, and then when it, it hits that index, it calls back to you, and you go, oh, heck, use. You go and implement it, you go and implement it, build the code, and then resume execution. So um, 
trap handy implies swap stack. So you've got, this is mu code run, executing here. This is the actual program running here. And it hits a trap and it jumps to the client. So the thread of control is now moved to the client. The thread of control is moved out of the mu context into the client context onto the client stack. Okay, in some other VMs, the way this is done, it's all on one stack, right? And if you look at the stack, you'll find this weird threading of frames that are for the executing program and frames that are for the VM that's doing stuff to the program. It's an extremely common implementation technique, right? So you have one stack, one thread, one stack for one thread. In fact, if you don't have swap stack, you pretty much don't have any choice. Right? So each thread has a single stack, and that stack will, by necessity, have this interleaving of um, the client code that is called to do with the VM itself and code that's actually executing the, the, the running program. And they're inter intertwined on this stack, which makes stack unwinding interesting and um, raises some other complicated issues. So we avoid that completely, courtesy of swap stack. Okay, so the mu stack, that's a, running, that's a, that's a client execution. All those frames there are mu frames. And the client stack over here is, you know, could be a C stack or whatever. Trap handling, so it's useful for lazy, lazy code loading, like I said to you before. It can, you can use it for runtime optimization, so you can have predicated code and trap out and re-optimize your code. You can use it for de-optimization, for debugging or whatever it might be. And you can use them for debugging, so you can put a trap in there for, for all, uh, all kinds of debugging reasons. All right, so we've just about come to the end of the whole of my description of Mu, and after this I'm going to jump in and dig deeper on um, the, uh, the swap stack and OSR, because OSR is, is a subject in its own right. So let's check, do a time check. Okay. So what do we have here? We've got a proof of concept of a virtual machine. It's minimal. We use LLVM as our frame of reference. It's designed from the very beginning for managed languages. Um, it offers concurrency, memory safety, and JIT. They're all first order concepts from, the, from a design point of view. And I guess this is one of the main reasons that differentiates us from LLVM, is that these were all baked in right at the beginning rather than added on later, later on. So um, yes, it's a very important part of the design of the, of the MU. All right, so now I'm going to change gears. To, anyone, anyone have any questions on any of that stuff that I've just been through this morning? If not, I'll go and dig deeper on OSR, and then we'll finish, OK? So why do we want OSR? I've hinted at this a lot already in, in the, um, this morning. Why do we want OSR? And there, there's, there's, a, there's a function here, OK? Foo, very important function. Does some stuff and does some other stuff, and then does this loop here. And um, it runs for a lot of iterations, OK? And then you've got this thing here that somehow that decides whether or not it's worth optimizing. And there are lots of ways that runtimes, dynamic runtimes, do this, right? They, they might just simply say, if I've executed this code enough times, then I should optimize it. Um, they, might, um, they might have other heuristics. They might have a timer-based optimization that says, I'm going to keep looking at the stack every n milliseconds. And if I keep seeing this thing at the top of the stack, then it must be important. So I'll, I'll go and optimize it. Right? And there are, there's a whole range of strategies for doing this. But the basic idea is you're dynamically optimizing code according to some criteria for importance of the code. Right? And exactly what heuristics you, you use to determine that something's important is, is, is a, another whole topic which I won't touch on. Right, so in this case here, we decide after the thousandth iteration, uh, uh, Laurie was saying this morning, I think it was 1024 or something in PyPy. Uh, anyway, at some point, uh, not power, a non power of two number. Okay, it's, there you go, thousandth maybe. Um, anyway, some, some number of iterations, you're like, heck, I need to be optimized. I really need to be optimized, okay? Um, and then you go and make some better foo over here, and you optimize it, and it's lovely. And maybe you, you might do something like loop unrolling, just for example, right? So you have this other version of it with lovely unrolled loops and something else. Um, then what are you going to do now? Okay. Um, in many runtimes, you have no choice now but to wait until this function foo gets executed again. In the next execution of foo, you get the lovely shiny new version, right? This is nice. Right? But for the remaining you know, 999,000 iterations of Foo, you get the sucky version. Right? So hopefully this motivates for you why you might want to do something different. Okay? And this is on stack replacement. 
okay, on stack replacement says, no, I'm going to stop right here, right now, in the thousandth iteration, and switch to my new code, right in the middle of it, implementing this, you know, I'm right at this, this point here of my function, I'm going to stop right here, build this new one, and somehow I'm going to slam in my new version on the, on the thing and recover my state. Kind of like open heart surgery on a runtime. All right, so what should we do? Well, we need to update the execution state and we need to replace the stack frame. Okay, so it looks like this. We go, we go back again to remind you, we've got this do something, something else, and then, um, all right, so we've got, we've got, this, we've got this, this something else thing called foo, okay, just say. And so we've got this main method here, something else, and then your foo sitting on top of the stack. And we've decided right now we need to optimize foo. So what do we do? Well, they're all paused. So we're gonna get rid of that foo frame which is the one that's not optimized, and we're going to replace it with a better foo and keep running, right? So that sounds fine. There's a few questions. First of all, why bother? Why don't you just write the, the thing correctly in the first instance, right? Why don't you just go to the trouble of do, unrolling the, the loop in the first case, right? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, maybe, it's, maybe you're not sure it's worth your while. And besides, you want to generate code as fast as you can. So these optimizations might be expensive. You say, look, I don't really want to go and unroll every loop and do O3 optimization on every single piece of code. And why might you want to do that? There's a few different reasons why you might not want to do that. One is it takes time to do O3 optimization compared to doing their basic uh, comp compilation. That's one reason why you not, might not want to do it. And you want to get your program up and running as fast as possible. You don't want to optimize the gazoo out of everything before you can run your hello world. Right? Because maybe you, that's all you're doing. Maybe it's just hello world. You don't really need everything massively optimized. You want some responsiveness. That's one reason why you don't optimize everything at the beginning. Any other reason? Yeah. That's the, that's the really compelling reason in the context of dynamic languages. You may not have enough optimization to know how to do it. Okay? If it's loop unrolling, well, sure, you've got enough information for that. But in dynamic languages, there's a lot of other things you might want to optimize for that you don't have enough information until the program is run for a little while. So let's look at this here. This is right down that track here. So we've got some very trivial piece of code here. So let's have a look at that. Now, what are the types of high and low? Anyone? Pardon? Numbers. numbers. Yeah, the point is we don't, we, we've got to materialize it as something concrete if you're going to compile this down to x86, right? So what are, you going to, what are you going to do here? Well, the answer is you don't know, right? Uh, we know there is only a finite uh, data types for numbers. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you can do it exhaustively, right? Maybe. But that could, be expen that could also be expensive, right? And particularly if you... Right. Right. All right. So let's let's look at it concretely. I'm going to. So so here's a piece of code here. So take this simple piece of code here. All right. Now if I take that piece of code and I compile it in my Java VM, what do I get? Anyone? That's that's actually what we get in MUAR. Okay. No tricks. Right? You just get an add instruction. Well, no, that's not MUAR, but you just get a simple add, uh, some risk instruction set. You just get a simple add instruction. Why? Because you know in, in Java you know statically that that's an int and that's an int and that's an int, and so you just simply do an add. It could be, but you would know statically if they were, right? So statically you know if they're strings or they're ints, right? And I know from the context that this is an int, right? So if it's in Java, you know they're ints or strings or whatever. Okay, in Python, this is the equivalent code. <laughs> right? So this is this is what really happens, um, and so you've got a you've got a problem here. And as the person over here said, um, you may want to optimize this once you realize that actually they are ints. These things are really ints. These A, B, and C are all ints. Just say you discovered this is true generally. Well, it seems to be mostly true. Then it'd be kind of nice if you could do this instead of that, right? And that's exactly the sort of thing we very often do in a, in a, in a, um, in a runtime for a, for a dynamic language. So runtime optimization. We say someone does this. They, say, call, they call this function here, and they, they have these two values here. 
okay? And we say, oh, well, they both look like they're integers. So we'll just, so then that makes these integers, and what zero is integer anyway. So S is then an integer, and well, low is an int, and I is an int, and so forth. And so then you can say, well, we can just do this. And this, would, this would be a perfect implementation of that instance of that call to um, that adding function, right? And you can see that, um, that so we specialized it now, so that, um, and you can imagine that if we did that, then these, these things here would, would bottom out to one instruction each, a simple add instruction. Okay, so this is specialized. So the point here is that some very important optimization opportunities only exist in, in, at runtime for dynamic languages. Okay. So, so what do we need in order to be able to do this? Well, first of all, if we want to be able to do this OSR thing that I've been talking about for a while, we need to be able to introspect into the frame. With the, the, if you've got a bad version of the function, you need to be able to look there and say, where am I? Which iteration am I up to? What are the live variables? And so forth. And you've got to do that introspection. That's one part of it. And the other thing is you need to have a mechanism for whacking the new one, the, a new frame, you're synthesizing a new frame and put it in place of the old frame. So you need both of these abilities. Okay, the ability to synthesize a new frame and blow away the old one, and you need the ability to know what the state is and be able to prepare this execution so it continues in the correct, from the correct point of view. In case you think I'm overdoing how hard this is, so there's the implementation of OSR in the runtime that I spent a lot of, Java runtime that I spent a lot of time on was done by a guy at McGill. That was basically his PhD. Doing proper, doing OSR correctly is, 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 um, is actually a really big deal. So how do we do it here? Well, what we do is we explicitly use keeper lives for the variables that we need for, um, um, for OSR. So we explicitly, the, the, the client can explicitly label the state that we want to be able to do OSR. So you can have a defined OSR points and we can say explicitly what variables need to be kept alive for that. In terms of on-stack replacement, what we do is we take a trap, we jump from our mu stack onto our trap handler, get rid of the, the foo frame and replace it with a better foo. Okay? and then we can continue our execution from the same place. But we can only do that because we've got a swap stack primitive, which takes this thread of execution, makes it run on a different stack. Okay? Normally, you can only, the, the, the thread and the stack are in, in, inextricably tied together, so you can't do this. So how do they implement it on existing runtimes? If they don't have swap stack, which they don't, how do they do this? Anyone know? It's really scary. What you have to do is you, um, you got a single stack, now you're the VM, and underneath you is a frame you want to fix, right? And you need to basically dig around underneath yourself, pop the new one in place, and then return to the place where you were, okay? Which is very scary, and what you need to understand is that you need to respect the values of the program counter and so forth when you're doing that, so you can call back to the right place. However, if you written, if, you're, if the method that's doing all this stuff is written in C, for example, you cannot control the program counter and the, the frame construction and so forth when you're writing C code, right? You can't, as a C programmer, control the way the program counter is except at a very high level, right? And you can't, you certainly can't control where, what the frame pointer is doing, right? So how do you do that? How does V8? implement OSR. Anyone? Can anyone imagine how they deal with that, that particular point, the crucial point when you want to jump execution back to where you were? Yeah. Right? And it's horrific. So um, that's, that's how you do it. Okay, and that's the simplified version. I can, you can go and find, you can go and look this up yourself. And this is really error prone and it's all hard coded. Okay? So it's, um, it's, it's very inflexible and it's a real, it's a, it's a weak point in the VM. And it's not just V8 that does this, most VMs do it this way. And, you, and it's a necessity for the reasons I just explained because if you're running on this same stack, you cannot, unless you're using something like inline assembly, you cannot control those parts of the, 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 the way that the frames are laid out and the, um, the, the state of the frame points and the, the state of the PC. All right. So, and this is because there's only one threat. And here's a lovely animation from Kunshan. Okay, so there you are, you're sitting on top of your stack, you're all happy, and then you decide you need to do an OSR, so 
you <laughs> have to replace it, and then you're happy again after you've replaced it. This is quite a scary thing to do. So what does Mu do? Well, if you modify a stack, you must not be on that stack yourself. All right, right? So that says that what you have to do is you have to jump to the handler, and then you no longer look at this as a stack. You say, this is just a big object out there. It's a big pile of objects that I can manipulate. And then you fix them up. You pop the frames up to there. And you push the one that you want. And then you can continue execution. So how do we create frames? Well, a frame has a thing called a resumption. I'm just looking at the time here. I might just have enough time to finish this. Um, so the key ideas are a frame has a thing called a resumption point. A resumption point is the point at which execution can resume. And that's usually at a call site. So it's a place where you call something else. And we have a received type and a return type. So um, here, that there is a resumption point. So this is where you'd get returned to. This is where a function would receive uh, a return, right? In a normal, in a normal program, OK? We we'll just give it a name. We we'll call it a resumption point, OK? So if you do a return from bar, you'll land right here, right? And that resumption point has got a type because it's expecting a particular type from bar. And here, this is the return type, and the return type is an int. Okay? So what we can do is we can think of a frame in any particular state of a particular frame as having a, oops, of having a, um, a resumption point which has a, a type on it, and um, also its return type. Okay? And then we can look at the stack like this. And we can say, that's actually faint blue. doesn't look at it, but there's a blue frame down there. So foo has a resumption point that expects a double right here. Uh, bar has a resumption point that expects a long, or it will, that will take a long, which is right here. And factorial um, uh, is, um, does not have any resumption point marked in there. I haven't marked one in there. But it has a return type, which is a long. So it fits in like that. Now, if we do an OSR in, um, in Mu, we can, all we need to do is to, re to respect that protocol. There, there's a protocol here that we need to respect. So what we can do, we can do crazy stuff in Mu if you want to. So you can blow away factorial and replace it with fib. Isn't that fun? Right? As long as they match. Right? So you can, you, as long as the frame that you replace it with matches, you can do that. So you, all you need to do is construct a frame that matches that protocol. And so it's quite powerful. Um, so you can do stuff like re return-oriented programming. Okay? Um, and the resumption points in this case are interesting because we've got resumption points as being the call point, wh where the thing is called. You can consider that to be a resumption point because it's an entry point to your function. So in this case, you could say that the resumption point is actually where you're called. So this is in return-oriented programming. And that's an int. This one's an int here, and this one's an int. And so what you can do is you can return from here into the call of this, right? So now you have plus one returning into times two, right? Even though times two never called plus one, and there's no, not even any call at all inside, inside of times two, you can have plus one return into times two, right? So you can do all kinds of weird and wonderful things here with the way you compose your stack frame. So it gives you, a, a, as a language implement, it gives you a lot of flexibility. So is this implementable? Well, if you thought about it, there's actually something a bit strange here. Because the way you, you do um, the state of the registers and so forth on entry to a call is different to what ha you expect when you have just called something yourself. So when you're the callee, it's different to when you're the caller. So you need some sort of protocol for what's in what register. So what we, have, we have this notion of a resumption protocol. And so um, it talks about what the, how the registers use and what the stack state is. And then, so what you need to do is you need to not just match the type, but also the resumption protocol. And this also, um, so in this case, you've got a re return value in a register, and that's a re that basically reflects a resumption protocol. And so you, if you were going to replace it, you're going to have to replace it with something which respects that same protocol. So in this case here, the return value is received in RAX here. And here, however, that argument's received from RDI. So these two things are actually incompatible, right? They're not compatible in terms of their protocols. So if you wanted to do what I showed you before, you've got a little bit of a problem. So how can you deal with that? Anyone, can anyone guess how you deal with that? So you can never understand the problem here. Although they have the same type, they don't act, they're not actually using the same registers. They're not following the same protocol. So simply slamming those frames on top of each other isn't going to work, OK? Because they're using different registers. 
So if we know what the protocols are, how can we make this work? Anyone? Yep. Perfect. Right, so you can just plug in an adapter frame. So here, we don't have the right resumption protocols. So they're both of type int, but one is putting the int into one register and the one is expecting it in the other. So you can introduce an adapter frame, which allows you to do that. And then you can build up arbitrary um, stackings of, of, um, of frames. And that it brings me to the end. And I think, yeah, we've got three minutes left. So I'll leave that on the screen. And uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, we've got three more minutes for questions. Right, okay, so this, your, your question is a general question about OSR. Uh, about, like, how do you write kind of optimization? Yeah, no, I, I understand, I'm just, I'm just saying that what you're, what you're actually asking is a general question about how OSR works. And can anyone guess, the, they're, they're, so people have worked very hard on this, a lot of people, a lot of very smart people have worked very hard at this problem. So how might you tackle it? Has anyone got, got any suggestions on how you might deal with this? The, the, the question was how would you write an optimization if you're constrained, you've got your, your hands tied behind your back, by the fact that it, you've got to somehow to match up the current execution with this weird state, which is not optimized. So somehow you've got to, you're doing two things here, aren't you? One is you want to make foo really f fancy and smart. And the other one is you need to be able to switch from be uh, slow foo to fast foo dynamically. So two things, make foo fast. Second, make the fast version of the foo compatible with the slow version of foo. And can anyone guess how you handle this? So that, that's your, that, what you're saying is that seems to constrain you very heavily in terms of the optimization. That's what you're concerned with. Anyone, anyone see? Is there actually a general, general solution to this? You can always de-optimize. Right? But I don't think we've got to the heart of his question. His question is, doesn't, this, doesn't the fact that you're in an OSR context constrain the optimizations that you can do? And therefore, doesn't that slightly defeat the whole idea of OSR? That's your question. And the answer is it doesn't. The answer is it doesn't. And, um, the, and I'm just asking folks in the room, if you've got any guesses as to how people, this has not, got nothing to do with Mu, this is to do with the history of OSR, um, how they solve that problem, how that problem is solved. Yep. Maybe, maybe different JIT compilers for different purposes. Essentially, the technique is you write a separate piece of code that does a transition, right? You generate transition code as well. So what you do is you ignore the fact that you're doing OSR. You just build your shiny new foo, right? And here's your lovely, lovely new foo, which is optimized to the gazoo. And you did not consider the fact that you're in an OSR context when you did that optimization. You just made a beautiful foo, right? And then what you did is you very cunningly and cleverly wrote some adaptation code that allowed you to jump into foo with exactly the right state. And that's, and that's the, the between state, right, right. And that's, um, that's not easy, right? But I'm just saying that but the, 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 that's not at all easy, right? That, that's, 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 that, that's hard. But the point is it's decoupling the two ideas. And you're worried about the constraints imposed by the former on the latter. And I'm saying the answer is, by writing some clever adaptation code, you can decouple the two and therefore liberate yourself and actually write optimized code. So are there no optimizations where you actually lose information? You override the buffer, originally just there. And then uh, that, that old value is gone. How can you recover it? So you're assuming that at any point, I can always come back to the state if one optimized state. That means I have well, no, no, what we, d okay, so the, all right, so the one, one question is, at which points can you actually recover the information you need? And the answer to that was our um, keep alives. 
So we make that explicit. So that's part of the deal with you, the client, is you have to say, this is an OSR point, and here's exactly the state, right, through these keeper lives. Right? That's why they're so important. Without that, you could, you'd run into this problem. You wouldn't know what state you could recover or couldn't recover. So you have to state what the keeper lives are, and so you can know how to, how to recover relatively easy. And that's the introspection. I had the diagram before saying there were two mechanisms going on here. One is the ability to throw away frames and put new frames on. That's a stack manipulation thing. And the other one was the ability to introspect. And the introspection means you need to be able to know that you can get exactly the state that you need. And that that part of it is dealt with through the keeper lives. A point to a stack frame? A frame and an issue? Yeah. Um, so you're saying in your current state, of your current frame. Well, you'd have to have that as a keeper live, that, that reference, whatever it's pointing to another frame or whatever is kind of not really relevant. The fact is you've got some reference and you need to keep that reference alive and you need to preserve that. It could be to another frame, it could be somewhere in the heap. You still have to preserve that. Yep. Not. It's not a particularly expensive thing at all. Uh, we, uh, yeah, so Kunshan has actually implemented this in C in LLVM and done OSR in LLVM using this thing because at the time he was building this framework up, we didn't have our Rust performance implementation of Mu ready. So, and he was impatient, like the kid with the marshmallow. So he went and implemented in, in LLVM and evaluated it. No, and you can do it very, 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 very efficiently. And that, there was prior work on that. That's the, the, the Trinity College work that shows that it's a, you can very efficiently move from one stack to another. Any other questions? I think we've actually run four minutes over time, so thank you for your time. I'll hand it back to Jan.